Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Last time we just got through the first six verses. We saw that this is the revelation, the apocalypsis. The Greek word apocalypsis means the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. Uh, Jesus has waited over 60 years to give this revelation to the last surviving apostle, the apostle John. We're going to see that John was sent to this island of Patmos. He was a political prisoner. He was sent there 95 AD. Now Eusebius, a church historian, wrote that it was uh, the emperor Domitian that put him there in 95 AD. Domitian ruled from 81 to 96 AD. And then in 96 AD, he, he dies. And then Emperor Nerva t takes over and he releases John from the island. Uh, there's a man by the name of Irenaeus, Irenaeus, Irenaeus. He was a direct disciple of Polycarp, who was a direct disciple of John the Apostle. And John, you know, ministered to Polycarp. Polycarp ministered to Irenaeus. And Irenaeus also says it was 96 AD when John was released from the island of Patmos. The only reason I bring that up is because there's a teaching going around preterism that says all Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. This was written in 65 AD and all that. But it's a bunch of nonsense because we're going to see most of the book of Revelation has not yet been fulfilled. So obviously these things we're going to look at in the coming months have not yet happened. So here's the Apostle John. He's about 95, 96 years old. He's probably thinking, you know what, I've lived a good life. God has blessed me. He's used me in so many wonderful ways. I'm ready to go home and be with Jesus. You ever feel that way? <laughs> I do. The longer we're around, it's like, I'm ready. Lord, take us out of here. We're, we're looking forward to seeing the Lord face to face. But little did John know that God wasn't quite done with him yet. And so in a moment, John is going to tell us how he was uh, given this revelation by Jesus and what he was instructed to do with the information he received. And as we'll see, sometimes Jesus would speak directly to John. Other times he'll use an angel to speak to John. But what we have here is the greatest, most detailed prophecy of all time. And because of that, it's been attacked by the enemy more than almost any other book in the Bible. In fact, the two books that Satan hates the most is the book of Genesis, tells us where we came from, and the book of Revelation that tells us where we're going. And so he does everything he can to try to distract us from reading this and studying it and believing it, and he does everything he can to attack this book. But now we pick up, uh, let's just back up a little bit, chapter 1, verse 4. So John says, John, everybody knew this was the Apostle John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who, who is and who was and who is to come. We saw that's a reference to God the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, we saw the number seven used 54 times in Revelation. It means the number of completeness or totality. So that's the Holy Spirit in all of his fullness. So this is coming grace and peace from the Father, from the Holy Spirit, who are before his throne, and, verse 5, from Jesus Christ, so we have the triunity of God mentioned here, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. We saw this last week. Loved us is in the present tense, so he continually loves us. Washed us, it's in the past tense, so he washed us once and for all in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. And we'll see this in chapter 5, that we are kings and priests unto the Lord through the millennial reign of Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7, we pick up, still part of the introduction. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. So this is the main overriding theme throughout the book of Revelation. Jesus is coming back, very clearly. He will come literally and visibly, as it says here, for all the world to see. Notice it says, behold, that simply means 
Give this your full attention. You know, take note of this. Set your mind on this. He is coming with clouds. We'll get into this in greater detail in chapter 19, but suffice it to say for now, these clouds are a reference to um, both clouds of angels and clouds of saints who come back with Jesus at his second coming. In chapter 19, verse 14, we're told that when Jesus descends from heaven, he's riding a white horse, he's clothed, you know, the brightness of his glory. And then we, the armies of God, clothed in white linen, says bright and clean, follow him on white horses. And so, and we're also told in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 that angels are coming back with the Lord. So it's just, Jesus comes forth first, we're all behind him, and it's going to look like billowing clouds just coming out of heaven, descending towards earth, and it says, every eye will see him. Notice it also says, every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. In, in other words, when Jesus returns, everybody's going to see him. All of his enemies will see him. All those who survived the great tribulation will see him but especially those who pierced him. And this is a reference to the Jewish people. The Jews are going to survive. One third of all the Jews that are living when they're after the rapture, when they survive, we'll see that two thirds do not survive, but the one third that survive, God will protect for three, the final three and a half years of the great tribulation. And when Jesus returns, they're gonna see him. He's our Lord, he's our savior. He's always been our Messiah. Every Jew will get saved. Um, Romans 11, 25 and 26 says, All Israel will be saved when Jesus returns. The same scene is given to us in the Old Testament, Zechariah 12, verses 9 and 10. It says, It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now we're seeing more and more nations gearing up to come against Jerusalem. If you've been keeping tabs on what's going on, um, especially in Syria, because Iran keeps hauling all, I mean, tons and tons of armaments over to Syria. And the last couple of weeks, uh, Israel keeps sending jets over bombing uh, Iranian supplies in Damascus and other places in Syria, because they know Iran doesn't hold any secrets back. We want to destroy Israel. We want to wipe them off the map. We want to push the Jews in the Mediterranean. That has always been their charter that's always been what they've said they're going to do so it's getting it's building up so anyway god will destroy all the nations that come against jerusalem i will pour out on the house of david on the inhabitants of jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication then they will look on me whom they pierced yes they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn Again, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, because this is when they realize Jesus has been, always was, our Messiah. He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He's the Lord God Almighty. But for most people, at the second coming of Christ, it's going to be too late, because those that survive the Great Tribulation, they're the ones that take the mark of the beast, right hand, forehead, 666, and they'll be wiped out by the Lord. Those that survive will be primarily the Jews. There'll be some others who will make it through safely. But the good news is every Jewish person at that time will get saved as they recognize he is our Messiah. So again, verse 7, Behold, he is coming. That's good news. And set your mind on good news. Always remember, Jesus is coming. In other words, don't set your mind on all the junk of the world, all the garbage on the news, all the lies that people are perpetrating constantly, set your mind on Jesus. Don't be consumed by all those around us that are always squawking and saying things to distract us. It can be, you know, Vladimir Putin. It can be Joe Biden. It can be Donald Trump. It can be a number of people throughout the world that want attention they're seeking attention. The answers to all of the world's problems are Jesus Christ, and he is coming. Never forget that. Yes, politics, that's fine. We're free to vote. Paul wasn't when he was alive. John wasn't when he was alive. 
we have that privilege. So yeah, we take advantage of that privilege we've been given. Be good stewards over those things. But the bottom line is our hope is not in who's in D.C. or who's in the CDC. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. He is coming. Colossians 3, verses 2 through 4 reminds us, Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. In other words, Jesus is coming. And when He comes back, He will right every wrong. He will wipe out all of His enemies. He alone will bring and establish true peace on earth because he's going to rule and reign on this planet for 1,000 years. Now in verse 8, Jesus speaks for the first time in the book of Revelation. How do I know? Because mine's red letter edition. <laughs> I'm being facetious, but I'm not, because this is Jesus, as we'll see. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so... Remember that. This is how he concludes the, the greeting to the seven churches. He's reminding us he is the Lord Almighty. He is God Almighty. In other words, Jesus is sovereign over everything, over every person, over every event within this book of Revelation. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. That means that Jesus is both the originator, co-creator with the Father and the Holy Spirit of all things, and he is the one who will be the consummator of all things. He is going to bring it all to an end. He's going to allow it to be destroyed. And then ultimately, he is going to destroy everything, the heavens and the earth, this earth. And he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth because he is the almighty God. Now, this title, Alpha and Omega, it's a title that's reserved only for God. That's why most cults will look at verse 8 and they will try to deny that this is Jesus speaking here. After all, we just saw in verse 4 that it says of the Father who is, who was, who is to come. Here in verse 8, of Jesus who is, who was, and is to come. That's something only God can say. The bottom line is this. The Bible is clear that Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, co-creator, co-equal, co-eternal, in other words, Jesus is God. He is God the Son. He's without beginning, without end. Check out these verses in Isaiah 41, verse 4. It says, Who has performed it? Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first and with the last. I am He. So the Lord, Yahweh, is the Alpha and the Omega. Look at Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, Yahweh, the King of Israel, well, who's that? That's Jesus, the King of kings, Lord of lords. And his Redeemer, who's the Redeemer? Jesus, the Lord of hosts. This is the Father and Jesus speaking. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Now, though, there are those who will argue that Jesus never claimed the title uh, of God. They'll, they'll say Jesus never claimed to be the Alpha and Omega for himself. Well, that's not true. Look at verse 11 here in Revelation 1. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Skip ahead. Look at Revelation 1 17. Jesus says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and then the last. That's what that's Alpha and Omega. It's, it's that simple. That's what it means, beginning and the end. I am the first and I am the last. I am he who lives and was dead. Well, who's that? Well, that's only Jesus. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Okay, this one's on the screen, Revelation 22, 12 to 13. This is Jesus speaking. You can't get any clearer than this. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I mean, he uses all three phrases. It's like, don't, re you know, don't forget who this is. Jesus is making it as clear as possible that he is the Almighty One. He is God, the maker of heaven and earth. And so we can have complete confidence in all that he does and all that he says throughout his word. And so this truth, it's one of the biggest truths of the Bible is Jesus Christ is God come in human flesh. We need to understand that. He is revealed to us as our great God and Savior, Jesus now, 
Anytime somebody knocks on my door and they're Jehovah's Witness and they try to deny Jesus has said these things and you take them to these verses and they'll try to you know do their little song and dance. No, no, no. And, and then you come to a point where you realize you're not getting anywhere. I always leave them with John 8.24. It's on the screen, but you can write John 8.24. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, that's the eternal name of God, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. That's how important this doctrine is. If Jesus is less than God, he could not die for our sins. God would not make a created being to be the savior of mankind. A created thing could not be perfect. Jesus is perfect in every way because he is God the Son. So beginning in verse 9, this is where John now is uh, given this revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus hasn't seen John. John hasn't seen Jesus, I should say, in over 60 years. And what a reunion this is. John has never seen Jesus like this before. Maybe a glimpse at the transfiguration. But check this out, verse 9. I, John, everybody knows this is John the Apostle. Everybody knew this. Everybody knows this. Both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is where John tells us who he is, why he is on this island, and where he is, this island. First of all, why was John banished to this island? Because it says he was faithful. He was a faithful witness to proclaim the word of God. He was faithful to testify about Jesus Christ. And in that day, within the Roman Empire, what John was saying was looked down upon as hate speech. He didn't call it hate speech then, but it's the same thing as what people say today is hate speech. Every time you tell somebody, well, you know what, you're a sinner and you need a savior, that's hate speech, you can't judge me like that. That's what they were saying about the apostles, about the Christians, about John in that day. You know, what do you mean, old man, Jesus is Lord? Caesar is Lord. You can't tell me Jesus is the only way to heaven. That's too narrow-minded. That's what they were saying to John back then. You've got to be the most narrow-minded person alive. No wonder why the Romans are putting your kind to death. That's how they looked at Christians. By this time, they've already put hundreds of thousands of Christians to death. As I mentioned last week, in the first 250 years of Christianity, six million Christians were put to death primarily for saying Jesus is Lord. And they refused to say Caesar is Lord. It's sad but true. Notice that as John is writing this to the seven churches, he lets them know, I'm your brother and companion in these tribulations, in these sufferings that they were all going through. John certainly understood he wasn't immune to you know, the beatings, the tortures, the persecutions. He knew what his brethren were going through throughout the world. It was in John's gospel that he quotes Jesus saying this in John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he goes, I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. In this world you'll have tribulation. The Greek word there is thalipsis. And thalipsis is simply the part of the grain um, you call it like a sled that would run over the grain and it would help separate the wheat from the chaff. That's the definition of thalipsis. It was used to break up the grain so the grain could be winnowed, throw it up in the air, the chaff would blow away, the heavier grain would fall. That's what God allows into our lives. He allows tribulation, thalipsis, not the great tribulation, that's different. But the ellipsis, we are not immune, uh, immune from. We can all go through it. But this is what persecution does. It separates the wheat from the chaff in our own lives. What chaff? I don't know. Pride, envy, jealousy, bad habits, sinful things we do. God allows us to go through trials, tribulations, because he wants to get rid of that stuff. He's not doing it to punish us. He loves us. But he allows things into our lives because he's wanting to draw us closer to the Lord. So not only was John on this island because he was a faithful follower of Jesus and because of the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, 
But the Lord put him there so that he could receive this amazing revelation from Jesus Christ. All these things concerning the last days. Again, the same is true for us. We may go through hard times physically, emotionally, spiritually, but what is it? Ask yourself, what is it that God wants me to learn? What is it that God wants me to understand? What is he wanting to do in my life through this hard time, through this trial, tribulation, whatever it is? What is he? Because he's done that in my life numerous times. He allows me to go through something, might be an illness or whatever, but this is the real meaning behind verses like Romans 8, 28. And we know that some things, <laughs> no, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. So don't let difficult experiences get the best of you, but draw closer to Jesus. Ask Him, Lord, what are you trying to show me through this difficult time? There are times when God must get us out of our comfort zones so that He can deal with us in those areas that are often difficult for us to confront. Again, what area is the Lord showing you? This needs to be dealt with. Maybe this is why I'm going through this, because I'm holding on to bitterness. I'm holding on to resentment. I'm holding on to lust. I'm holding on to the sinful habit. God, you need to purge this out of my life, and God will because he loves us. So there's a lot of different reasons why we go through things. What was John's reason? He was not a sinful man. <laughs> he's 95, 96 years old. Pretty much not any temptation he's going to worry about. But it was because God had this revelation for him. Remember what I said last time. A lot of times God will allow us to go through isolation because we can then receive his revelation. So verse 10, it says, John speaking, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now, some think being in the Spirit on the Lord's day refers to Sunday. Uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because, again, this is the Apostle John. He was pretty much in the Spirit every day. It's not like some people we know. I'm in the Spirit. It's Sunday. I'm going to put on my Sunday best. Then the rest of the week, you live like Hades. But, you know, Sunday, oh, i got to put on a happy face. i got to do the right things. I'll confess all my sins or whatever it might be. No. I believe this refers to John being catapulted by the Holy Spirit into the spiritual realm. And he's going to see these things, referring to the day of the Lord. He'll see things that are in the future. He will witness God's direct intervention into all these events that we will read about in the coming months. This phrase is also used by John in a few other places, like in chapter 20, 21. Um, turn a picture in my mind where it says, that he was um, in the spirit, and his angel took him to a high mountain, and from there he was able to see all of New Jerusalem, the heavenly city, this giant cube. So he's in the spirit. Not that he was there on a Sunday seeing this, but no, he was catapulted by the Holy Spirit to see things that are not natural. I'm sure there are some of us who would love to have this kind of encounter with Jesus. Notice the first thing John hears at this moment is, a loud voice as of a trumpet. There's no doubt about who this is. And John will instantly recognize the Lord's voice. I, I wish sometimes I had that kind of clarity. Instead of thinking, Lord, is that you? Are you telling me this? Are you showing me that? And, and you kind of wrestle through things. I mean, John will know who this is very quickly. But this is why it's so important for all of us to get alone with God, to spend time in His presence every day. You know, when I got saved, it was November 30th, 1977, Calvary Chapel, San Diego. I mean, it, I can remember the day so vividly. It's just like, you know, it's there. It's ingrained. From day one, well, the day one when I first got my new Bible, actually my unbelieving mom gave me my first Bible. I still have it in my office. It's all marked up because as soon as I get home from school, I was at San Diego State, I mean, I'd spend two or three hours just reading through the Bible, just underlining everything I could think, you know, everything the Lord is showing me. And from that day to this day, that's the first thing I do every morning. You know, I, I have coffee now. I used to not drink coffee, but it helps. It helps make you more alert to the things of the Lord. Um, no, but you, you're there and you're just in the Word. You're letting the Holy Spirit just 
bring the word of God to life within you. There's no substitute for being in the word of God if you want to hear the voice of the Lord. Here's John. All of a sudden he hears a loud voice. It says, as a trumpet. It's not a trumpet he hears, but it's just a loud voice. If any of you have heard like some of the Jewish trumpets that sound, if you've ever been over there and hear it's loud, it's piercing. And so it's an important announcement, but he hears his voice very loud saying, verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, that's present day Turkey, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So now, once again, Jesus takes his title of deity for himself. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Again, there are many verses that declare the deity of Jesus Christ. He is eternal. No beginning, no end. No, you know, you can go eternity past. He was there. Eternity future, he'll be there for a short 33 years or so, he left heaven, came to earth, lived as a human being, took on human flesh. Again, he did amazing things, healing the sick, cleansing lepers, opening blind eyes and deaf ears, raising people from the dead, casting out demons. He was demonstrating the heart of the Father, you know, to a lost, perverted, wicked generation of people. But it was done to prove who he was, why he came from heaven to earth. Jesus was the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He alone proved through what he went through that he alone could wash away anyone's sins. He can give anyone eternal life. Only God could do that for sinful people like us. So we come to Christ. But the deity of Christ, it's one of the foundational truths of Christianity, because if you undermine that biblical doctrine of the deity of Christ, then the rest of the Bible collapses because it's all built on Jesus. He is the rock. He's the one we build our lives on. So John 1.1, 1, 1, real quickly. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not a God. He was God. John 1.14 goes on to say, the Word became flesh, so the God, the God became flesh, that's Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul says in Titus 2.13 that we are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and again, there are many verses in the Old and New Testaments that demonstrate, that prove, that declare Jesus Christ is God, God the Son. But his instruction to John was simple. It's straightforward. Notice he says here, what you see, write it in a book. And that's what we have, the book of Revelation here. He'll be meticulous to write down everything that he sees. In fact, he, uh, there's these seven thunders that utter their voices, and he's going to write that down. And the angel says, no, don't, you can't write that down. So we're left, you know, like, what was that? We don't know. He didn't write it down. But he's very meticulous. Everything he heard, everything he saw, he wrote it down, unless he was told not to. So here, as we come into verse 12, we're given the only definition, description, of Jesus Christ, but it's not a picture you can really paint on a canvas. I mean, this is God the Son in His glory. Look at verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed the garment down to his, the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as, it, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. So a lot of symbolism here. And this is one of the things, you know, people that have issues with the book of Revelation say, oh, there's too many symbols. 
Too much symbolism. We cannot understand symbolism. Well, yeah, we can, because almost everything that is mysterious in this book is revealed to us in other places, in the Old Testament or in the book itself. As we'll see here in a moment, we, we're given a description of who this is and, and what these attributes of Jesus are. So don't let that become an issue as we go through this, because here's a great example. As John turns to see the voice, the first thing he sees, notice again, it says seven golden lampstands. Well, in verse 16, we see that Jesus is holding seven stars in his right hand. So what does this refer to? Look at verse 20. Here's the uh, definition of what we just read. Here's the explanation of this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, and we'll talk about that when we get to the next chapter, the seven angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Again, we'll see this in chapters 2 and 3. So he's writing seven letters to seven specific churches, and here in verse 13, John sees Jesus as the Son of Man standing in the midst of these seven lampstands, seven churches. As we'll also discover, that's exactly where Jesus needs to be in every aspect of our life, our lives. He needs to be in the midst of our church. He's the head of this church, not me or anybody else, not the board, but the Lord. Too many people put the board before the Lord. No, we don't want to be board run. We want to be Lord run. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the one we answer to. He's the one we look to. And uh, he's right where he needs to be, the head of this church. He needs to be in the midst of your marriage. He needs to be in the midst of your business dealings with others. He needs to be in the midst of your heart living, moving in you and through you. We need to be a body of believers gathered together in his name. Unfortunately, as we study through the seven churches, there's a couple of churches Jesus is not in the midst of. In fact, he leaves these churches because they're doing things that are not biblical. And if you saw the paper yesterday in the Daily Senile, Daily Sentinel, um, there's a church in Chicago. It's a ridiculous church. I don't even know. I wouldn't even call it a church. They've been around for years and years, but they've had, you know, women pastors down through the last few decades. Um, this is last week. They closed their doors saying, we're taking a step of faith. God wants us to close this church down. Are you kidding me? You just lost. Jesus said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. But here's a church. They're doing everything opposite of what God's word says. And it was sad looking and they had everybody on the stage and they're all masked up, little kids all masked up. I'm like, you're bound down to this world. You're not living for Jesus. And you're, I can guarantee they're not teaching the word of God. They're not standing up for what is true and right from the scriptures. They're, they're probably into all the alphabet soup that's out there as well. I mean, it's so sad because Jesus said, I'll build my church. And there's churches we're going to see. They're just like that in the book of Revelation. And he says, I'm on the outside knocking. He's not even in the church. He's not in the midst. He says, if you'll open the door and let me in, I'll come in. But they didn't want him in because they didn't want to obey the word of God. It's so sad. The lampstand, he mentions here he's in the midst of the lampstand. That's a beautiful picture of what the church should be. A lampstand, it's to shine light. Light refers to truth. We're to be light and truth to those around us. Jesus is the light of the world. John 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He also tells you and me, his bride, his church, that we're light. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. I mean, this is what you do at the lampstand. Nor do they put a light, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, when John first turns around 
and is able to figure out who it is that is talking to him. It says he sees the Son of Man. That's an Old Testament referral to the Messiah. It's found in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus, the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man. Now here in verse 13, it describes Jesus clothed in a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. So these are the garments of a high priest. These are the garments of a faithful judge, and Jesus is both. He is the ultimate high priest. He's the ultimate judge. So that's how John sees him as well. As our high priest, we go directly to him. He's, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We go directly to God through Jesus Christ. He's the faithful judge. Over and over again, he says, you know, all judgment has been given to me. And so he will judge this world. Notice again, it says here, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. Again, that's how the prophet Daniel saw the Lord as well. This speaks of his eternal nature, his matchless purity, his holiness. Um, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, sh his face sh shined like the sun. So all of this brilliance. I like this one. It says, his eyes like a flame of fire. In other words, Jesus can see through anything. <laughs> you can't hide anything from Jesus. You know, you can hide stuff from me and I can hide stuff from you. And, you know, we can do whatever you think we get away with. But you know what? You can't hide anything from Jesus. He has eyes like a flame of fire. That means his eyes penetrate, see into the very depths of our being. He sees all the wickedness, all the corruption that is happening in the world around us. This is what Hebrews 4.13 says of Jesus. There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Again, he sees everything we're doing. And that can be good. He, he knows when you're living your life for the Lord. That's good. But he also knows when you're just going through the motions. You're playing games with God or other people. You're being deceitful. I mean, he sees right through that. So we need to be open and honest, confess to him that stuff, because he only brings it to light because, again, he wants us to have a closer relationship with him. Verse 15 tells us, His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. When you look at brass in the Old Testament, it refers to judgment, righteous judgment. We read of Jesus throughout the New Testament being the judge over the entire universe. Uh, I love this one. It says, His voice as the sound of many waters. It's just like, uh, um, like many waterfalls. I remember years ago, Elizabeth and I were in Hawaii, and we were in this you know, a little, I don't know, like lagoon, and there's a big waterfall that fell into it, and I'm standing next to her, and she's like right here, and I'm just screaming, you know, isn't this awesome? And she's like, what? I mean, you can't hear anything. It's just the noise of that waterfall. Well, that's what Jesus, when he speaks, that's the only voice that can be heard. When he speaks, his voice is a voice of power, it's a voice of authority, but at the same time, he can also whisper. That still small voice. He can speak words of soothing and comfort and encouragement. He's not just a voice yelling and screaming. No, his, his voice speaks peace, forgiveness. Remember the woman caught in adultery at the end? He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's the voice of Jesus. We need to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us from his word. So whether Jesus is speaking words of comfort or encouragement or even words of correction and reproof. We need to listen to what he has to say. Um, make no mistake about it, though. John knew the voice of his Savior, his friend. I mean, he's the one that he talks about in God, John's gospel. He's got his you know, head leaning up the, against the chest of Jesus during Passover. I mean, he was just so close to the Lord. The last surviving apostle... Even though it's been over 60 years since John heard from Jesus like this, I mean, he knows who this is. Jesus says this in John 10, 27, we can also hear the Lord. My sheep, meh, that's us, right? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Glorious. Then we read, next thing it says is, Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So out of his mouth proceeds the living, powerful word of God. So what is that symbolism? Sharp toward the sword coming out of his mouth. That must be weird. When we get to Revelation 19, when he descends from heaven and we're following him, it says that he strikes the nations with the sharp two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth. It's just the word of God. He doesn't have to you know, wave something and slash and dash. I mean, he just speaks. Whatever he says goes. So his is the voice of authority once again. The sharp two-edged sword is the word of God. Look at this verse. You're, you're familiar with this one. You know this. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God. This is why we need to be in it, because the Holy Spirit will use the word of God to do whatever he needs to do, bring conviction, encouragement, whatever it is. Uh, the final thing John says when he sees Jesus, it says, And his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. Again, just the glory of the Lord appearing to John. This is why John had to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Otherwise, he would have been vaporized. So do you know what John instantly realizes at this moment? It's the same thing we need to realize as well. Caesar is not in control. The Roman Empire is not the final authority. The Democrats are not in control. The Republican Party is not the final authority. Jesus Christ is. Amen. That's it. Don't ever forget that. Yeah, politics is fun. Yeah, no, it's not. Politics can be exciting. But keep your priorities straight. It's all about Jesus Christ. Russia, China, America. There's no country that's going to last forever. But Jesus Christ and his kingdom will reign for a thousand years and then will reign with him for eternity. The sooner we realize that, the better we'll be because Satan is doing all that he can right now to distract Christians from doing the real work of God, which is the gospel, proclaiming the good news to lost and dying sinners, not to argue about whether Trump should be in office or not or whatever they're doing. Yeah, pray for our leaders. We're to pray for them that we might live in peace, to proclaim the gospel, to teach the word of God. He wants us focusing uh, the enemy wants us focusing on all this political stuff around us because the more we are, the less focused we're on the gospel. People need to hear Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. Jesus went to the cross for their sins. They can call you names about that. I don't care if they say, you're a you know, Republican, you're a conservative, you're this and that. I don't care. I want them to see Jesus, not some R by my name or I by your name, or whatever you're going to go by. No, I want them to see Jesus. That's the bottom line. No entity on earth can stop the church. Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But the longer we focus on the wickedness and the corruption and the turmoil of the world around us, the more soul Satan is stealing, killing, and destroying. And we need to keep our priorities in order. Jesus says the gates of hell won't prevail against his church if we're doing things his way. Paul says when he's chained up in Rome, getting ready to be put to death, the word of God is not chained. Yeah, they can come against you. They can chain us up. They can lock us up. But even Paul, when he was in prison, proclaimed the word of God. So we read about all of Caesar's household getting saved. The guards he's chained to getting saved because the power of the gospel brings salvation. That's the power of the gospel. Not arguing about politics. Politics is fine, but keep it in its proper place. Don't ever put it before Jesus Christ. No matter how oppressive government gets, 
and ours is getting worse and worse and more oppressive. Nothing like some places I know of in the world, but it's going to get worse and worse. The Bible tells us it's going to get worse and worse. Men's hearts are going to go from bad to worse in the last days. That's not a surprise to me, but no matter how oppressive and wicked our government gets, Jesus is on the throne, not only in heaven, but he needs to be on the throne of our hearts. And then, when you understand these things, this is what Paul says in Romans 8, 37. And he's writing this when Caesar Nero was in charge. Joe Biden's a Boy Scout compared to Caesar Nero. But this is what he says about Nero. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to be more than a conqueror in God's kingdom. Not in this kingdom, not of this world. This world is perishing. Look at verse 17. John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. <laughs> He's like, okay, I'm done now. 95, 96 years old. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Again, Jesus comes in all of his power, all of his authority, all of his glory, not to scare John to death, but Jesus is revealing to John how awesome he is, that he is greater than, that's what the women are going to study, greater than, he, Jesus, greater than everything, anything. John is seeing Jesus as greater than any trial, any tribulation, any isolation that he finds himself in. Jesus is on the throne. He is in his glory. And can you imagine? He puts it says here he puts his right hand on John. Can you imagine just the Lord putting his right hand on your shoulder? Don't be afraid. John probably glanced over and once he see the nail pierced hand. My Lord, my Savior. Don't be afraid. In other words, John, you don't need to be afraid of anything, especially me. And I'm sure John knew at this very moment, this is why I'm still alive. This is why I've outlived all the other apostles by 25 years. This is why I'm still on this island as a political prisoner, to see my risen Lord and Savior once again. And to record this final message for the body of Christ. So for you and me, don't be afraid. God is with you. He loves you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. That's pretty clear. This is only Jesus. He's the only one that was dead and now is alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So he has the keys. He has the keys to life and death, heaven and hell. He has the keys. How sad that so many people are always searching for keys. Keys to success. Keys to happiness. Keys to making money. Key, I mean, there's so many books out there, you know, how to unlock the mysteries of the universe. So it's kind of cool to see this, you know, satellite they put up, and now they're getting all these images from far, far away in other galaxies and, you know, billions of whatever light years away, and they're seeing all this cool stuff. They're still searching for the mysteries of life. All you got to do is read Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Pretty much settles it for me. I just saved our country trillions of dollars. They won't listen to me, but it's crazy because everybody's looking for the keys, it's a, you know, the unlock the mysteries. They search in vain because all the while Jesus says here, he has the keys. Only Jesus can unlock the door so that you can be forgiven, so you can be saved, so you can know when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Only he has the keys for everlasting life. That's why we come to Jesus. Got to wrap it up. Verse 19, write the things which you have seen 
and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this, again, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So speaking of keys, this is the key verse for understanding the book of Revelation. Verse 19, write the things which you have seen. Past tense, what did, he, what did John just see? This vision of Jesus in all of his glory. So he's written that down. Then he says, write the things which are. What are the things which are? He says, well, the things which are, are the seven churches. The stars, seven stars are, the things which are, are the churches. From Pentecost to the rapture are the things which are. We'll look at this in detail in chapters 2 and 3 because these seven churches are, they were first century churches, but we'll see they're still going on today. Spiritually speaking, these churches are still going on. There's promises to these churches that because you kept my word, you've not denied my name, I will keep you from that hour of trial that's coming on the whole world, speaking of the Great Tribulation. So it's a promise of the rapture to one of these churches. Another church, because they're blowing it, he says, unless you repent, you're going into the Great Tribulation. And so he's got some amazing things to say. So chapter 1, the things which you've seen. Chapters 2 and 3, the things which are. And then write the things which are about to take place after these things. Meta tauta, there's two Greek words, meta tauta. That's what he says here in verse 19. Things which will take place after this. When you go to chapter 4, verse 1, that's the third part, the third part of the outline. It starts off saying, after these things, meta tauta, and then John is caught up into heaven. I believe that's where the rapture takes place in the book of Revelation. So he's written the things that he saw, past tense, the things which are, present tense, chapters 2 and 3, and then after these things, because from chapters 4 through 22, it's all future. It's all what's ahead of us. And I can't wait to get there, to heaven. I'm looking forward to getting through chapters 22, but I'm looking forward more to seeing Jesus face to face.